It's great to be joined today by Stephen Perlstein, who's a business and economics columnist at The Washington Post. He's also Robinson Professor of Public Affairs at George Mason University in Fairfax, Virginia. His recent book is called Can American Capitalism Survive? Why Greed is Not Good, Opportunity is Not Equal, and Fairness Won't Make Us Poor. Uh, Stephen, thanks so much for talking to me today. My pleasure. The book relates to so much of what we've been talking about on our program and so many of the sort of fundamental economic questions that are increasingly being discussed about the failings and successes of capitalism, social democracy, other economic systems. So maybe you can start just by kind of big picturing it for us. What are the fundamental problems that you see with the economic system we currently have in the United States? Well, um, as you know, a lot of young people uh, and even not so young people um, are sort of down on capitalism these days. Um, and they express some support for something else. They call it socialism. I'm not sure they know exactly what they mean by socialism. But in any case, there's a feeling that our system uh, is, is, not, uh, is not acceptable. And some of that has to do with the economics of it, that, that we have an economy that, although it's booming uh, and has, you know, been growing fairly well for a while with some interludes, uh, has left a lot of people behind. And so some of the anxiety is, is economic, and we know about that. But I'd say even probably even more is that we have a sense that our system has run off the moral rails, that it's lost its moral legitimacy, that it routinely offends our moral sensibilities. And for the last 30 years, we've been told by people uh, who I might call market fundamentalists that we should ignore um, our moral instincts. We should uh, ignore these feelings that something's not fair or something's not right uh, and simply focus on the fact that what matters is growth and GDP. And if you try to do anything about those moral instincts and repulsions that we have, that we're going to uh, we're going to kill the goose that lays the egg. Uh, and so what I tried to do in this book is go back to a set of ideas which are, lay behind this, this notion of ignore your moral sentiments and, um, and re-examine re them and uh, uh, find that they basically, uh, while there's a germ of truth in them, that they don't actually uh, hold up to scrutiny. Yeah, I, I'd love to talk a little bit about the origins of the idea that growth is something to be desired indefinitely and even something that is used as a sort of yardstick. Because if we think back to uh, hunter gatherer societies or even early agricultural societies, which were basically looking to create enough food for themselves to survive, sort of a subsistence approach, the idea of growth was only necessary to track the growth of the population and to sort of make sure you had enough food for people, right? So at what point did the idea of growth for the sake of growth become something seen as the, a goal, a good thing, a virtuous thing? I'm not sure I can answer that question, David. I mean, people, uh, you know, they lived this for most of history. Most of people lived a subsistence existence. And it was only during uh, at the point of the Industrial Revolution uh, that people began to see that they could actually live much better lives in terms of what they had, that not only the food they had, but the, the health and the housing and the clothing and um, the, the other parts of life um, that could be improved. And we've we've in general um, been on an upward trend ever since ever since then in the industrial world. And um, I think we I think we can pretty much all agree that that having rising standard of living is a good thing. Uh, and the way we have in general have got rising standard of living is that the pie has grown. And as the pie grows, each of our slice of the pie grows. They may grow a little bit unequally, but some because there is some growth, all of us do better today than we did before or that our parents did before. And that has been uh, pretty much the American story since uh, since people landed on these shores. So I'll get sort of my economic views out there just so the audience is kind of reminded of them. And you you know what where, where I sort of am. I find that a lot of the language you use, such as there is a sort of germ of truth 
in many of the talking points, but you need to contextualize them. Or we need to have competition, but it needs to be controlled competition. Basically, that all gets me to social democracy. I, I think that uh, having private ownership of businesses is OK. I am not for Stalinist communism and government ownership of industry. But I think that those germs of truth have been allowed to sort of fester uh, un, unmitigated, uncontrolled in a way that has become destructive. That's sort of my view on the germs of truth from capitalism's talking points. Can you give me sort of your perspective on that? Well, that's my my perspective, uh, too. Um, and we'll have to explore whether we agree about all the details of it. Um, but let's take one idea, yeah. which is that greed is good. Um, you know, that started out as something of a joke in a movie. Um, but in fact, it did become um, the sort of rallying cry for a generation in the 1980s. And it has be it becomes this sort of symbolic uh, way that a lot of critics uh, uh, think of American capitalism today. Now, of course, there's a, there's a germ of truth that I'm sure you understand and most people understand that a market system uh, depends on on uh, ambition and self-interest, uh, everyone trying in his own or her own way to improve his own standing, his own welfare, uh, and what he has, what the income is. And if everyone does that in a sort of selfish way, as Adam Smith reminded us, then in fact, not only is each individual better off, but all individuals are better off and the economy is better off and the society is better off. That's the invisible hand. Uh, we are led as if by an invisible hand uh, to a better place. Well, that's true. But, uh, you know, you can take that sort of thing so far. And Adam Smith also said in another book, um, The Theory of Moral Sentiments, that in fact, you have to do that in a context where people um, uh, treat each other fairly, in which the, the fruits of everyone's labor is divided, um, not only according uh, to, to, you know, their contribution, but somewhat fairly so that nobody um, is living in poverty, that people need to trust each other and not behave in a ruthless um, manner. Because if you do, if you do behave in a ruthless manner, then the system doesn't work so well. And that we all have a natural instinct, in fact, not only to do well, but to be respected and to be liked. And you have to behave in a certain way uh, in, or, in order to be respected and to be liked. So uh, it's a sort of nuanced thing. Yes, we also we all have a selfish gene, but we all have a cooperative gene. We all have an empathetic gene, and they they compete with each other um, to control our behavior. And if any one or the other gets out of hand, um, then our economic system doesn't work too well. Yeah, what, what's interesting about greed is good to stick with that one for a little bit, since since it's a good one. You, we seem to have there's a lot of polarization in general when we talk about politics, economics, et cetera. But in this particular case, I'm talking about polarization that leads people to one of two extremes. One is humans are greedy and therefore the correct system is one where humans are just allowed to be as greedy as they want to be. They're allowed to take as much as they are able to take based on force or whatever else. The other side of that can sometimes be greed is so bad that we need the government to take over industry to prevent that greed from playing any role. And it seems so obvious to me that the, the path that benefits the most people in the greatest way is let's first of all, instead of calling it greed, let's consider it human self-interest and let's create a system that allows the positive sides of ambition and self-interest to manifest while ensuring that nobody is getting left behind. That middle path seems to me to be the one that is almost like evolutionarily logical. But politically speaking, you don't really hear about it as much as some of the extremes. No, you don't. And it is ev it, 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 it is evolutionary required um, because as a species, uh, the reason we're uh, at the top of the food chain is because more than any other species, although others do too, we learn to cooperate. Right. We, uh, and that allows us, uh, we started out cooperating as, a, as a family unit, protect our children, then we became tribal, and if we cooperated within the tribe, we survived uh, and maybe we killed, or at least we, we were protected from other tribes. And then we widened the circle more and more. And the more we widen the circle of cooperation, the better we did as a species and and 
the better countries do when they when they are cooperative, when when people um, uh, do trust each other. Uh, and capitalism requires that. Democracy requires that. Uh, and uh, we've 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 lost we've lost, I think everyone agrees, a level of trust and cooperation in the United States. And we see that in political dysfunction. And in my opinion, we also see it in a slowing of growth. What are or let me phrase it a different way. Are there good examples in your mind of countries that are over regulating in a way where development is being stifled? Like, I don't think the United States is one of those examples. In fact, I think in the United States, we have many problems from lack of regulation. Right. Are there good examples of what too much regulation looks like? Yes. Um, France. Uh, and particularly France of 20 years ago, particularly or Germany 20 years ago, hmm. probably Italy falls in that category. Uh, yeah, um, th- those places uh, have got the balance slightly wrong. Um, when I, th- you know, you use the word regulation. I think we have to add to regulation in your formulation, regulation and things that equalize uh, incomes. Um, in other words, if you make things too equal, uh, kibbutz, communism, uh, you lose the ambition, uh, the ambition, innovative, creative uh, side of things and, and your economy becomes uh, less vibrant. S- Sweden is an example, I think, of probably a country that has got a good balance these days for Sweden. I don't, I don't mean to say that we all have to be like Swedes or Denmark, um, but they used to be much more regulatory, much more progressive in their tax and transfer uh, system, and they realized that their country was losing out in, in, in terms of innovation and creativity, and they pulled back on that. And now they've got a better balance. We probably went too far the other way. Let's and pause our the conversation way, there. This is a good good place to pause with Stephen Perlstein, whose recent book is Can American Capitalism Survive? Why Greed is Not Good, Opportunity is Not Equal, and Fairness Won't Make, up, make Us Poor. We will pick up our conversation with him tomorrow where we will will focus in a little more on specific economic policies. Stephen, thank you. Great to be with you, David. We're continuing our conversation today with Stephen Perlstein, who's a business and economics columnist at The Washington Post, also Robinson Professor of Public Affairs at George Mason University in Fairfax, Virginia. His recent book is Can American Capitalism Survive? Why Greed is Not Good, Opportunity is Not Equal, and fairness won't make us poor. Stephen, maybe now in part two of the interview, we could focus in on some specific economic policies, just to pick one that's in the the discussion a lot. When we think about the minimum wage, we often get what I call kind of bad faith arguments about the minimum wage. Ideas of, well, if more money for people is good, make the minimum wage $200, which of course nobody that I've heard seriously uh, consider the issue ha- has actually suggested. How should a society like the United States, an economy like the United States, conceive of how to set a minimum wage? We have a number um, of policies that uh, accomplish two things equalize income to some degree, but in the case of the minimum wage, I think there's something else. And it appeals to a, a moral instinct we all have, which is. Um, Nobody should should live in deprivation at a, in a rich country. So there should be a floor. And the minimum wage is one of several policies um, that work together nicely. And you wouldn't want to rely on any one of them too much. Uh, one is the minimum wage. One is what we call the earned income tax credit, which is essentially a wage supplement for that the government gives to individuals uh, who work uh, to boost up their wages. Um, And the third is a whole set of rules that we have that protect workers from uh, being taken advantage of. So so some of these things come after the market has spoken, uh, like the earned income tax credit, where you get a check back at the end of the quarter or the end of the year. Some of them work uh, beforehand, like the minimum wage or things like says you, you have the right to organize a labor union, the threat of which helps to low, uh, raise the wages uh, for people even who are not unionized. Or we have rules that say, you, you know, you can only make someone work 40 hours a week and after that you have to pay overtime. Those are sort of what, what's, what go under the category of pre-distribution as opposed to redistribution, but they work together to assure 
that nobody lives in deprivation or should live in deprivation, particularly people who work. And when it comes to the specifics of the minimum wage, how should it be set? In other words, the minimum wage should be set relative to what? And, and you know, to contextualize it, we sometimes see studies about what it costs for a one bedroom apartment in particular cities or states. We see comparisons to the federal poverty level, which has, you know, it's, it's a whole other can of worms in terms of how that's calculated. Right. How should we think about what the number should be? Well, we shouldn't think about it in terms of uh, what what rents are. Um, you have to think about it in terms of when it becomes self-defeating, how when it gets to a certain level so that businesses behave in ways that are counterproductive to the people who are trying to help or to the economy as a whole. Um, and, you know, it's a judgment call. Uh, and as I say, you need to see it in the context of other th things. Let me just give you an example with working with the EITC. Yeah. If you had a high minimum wage, then the company essentially pays most of the raising for most of the raising and the government contribution goes down. Whereas if you have a relative like we do today, a low uh, minimum wage, then the EITC tops you up. But, you know, it's a question of, well, do you want to let the businesses off the hook? You could get rid of the minimum wage and just rely totally on an EITC. But that well, that would mean is for the lowest skilled workers, um, uh, the government would be uh, and the, therefore the taxpayers would be doing the subsidy. Whereas if you have a higher minimum wage, the subsidy comes from somewhere else. Who pays the subsidy in a higher minimum wage? Let's be clear about it. Sometimes shareholders are owners of company, but it's just as likely as other, other employees pay it uh, or customers pay it. And there's nothing wrong with that, but you have to sort of analyze where you want the subsidy to go and whether the subsidy gets so high, high that it starts to distort economic behavior in ways that reduce efficiency, reduce growth, reduce the kind of incentives that you want. So it's a judgment call, but I don't think you look at it, I, you should look at it in terms of um, the minimum wage should guarantee that everybody has a certain standard of living. That's putting too much weight on that one policy. If we think about the minimum wage and the earned income tax credit as a sort of floor or something meant to lift the bottom, yes. what should we be considering at the other end of the spectrum? What would be, how progressive do you think the tax brackets should be at what point and to what degree should we be taxing really high incomes? Where are you on, on sort of the top end of the spectrum? I'm not with the, there, there's a sort of a, the Piketty group uh, and others who think that we can go to 70% and 80%. I'm not in that group. I think you do distort behaviors. Um, I think when you start getting a, a lot above, and the Swedes d discovered this, a lot above 50%, you start getting uh, behaviors you don't like. And the first behavior you get is you get tax avoidance. You get people moving out of the country. You get people playing games. Um, you know, a lot of people like to say, oh, we had tax rates of 90% in the 1950s and look, we had a great economy. Well, nobody paid 90%. Uh, no one was that dumb. Uh, and 90% will have a bad, uh, a bad disincentive effect on, on working and investing. So you want to be careful. 50% uh, combined with other kinds of things, like getting rid of a lot of loopholes, so that 50% is closer to the effective tax rate rather than just the marginal rate. That's one thing you can do. You certainly want to tax uh, on uh, inherited wealth. Uh, we have a lot more to go that we could tax on that. It has, doesn't really have bad incentive effects because uh, you know the, the, the guy who's working is dead and uh, the people who get it, it's a windfall for them. So um, there are other things we can do to raise money and, and, and deal with a bit more redistribution. But I want to emphasize here that I'm in the camp um, that thinks we, the thing we need to focus on more than redistribution, we do need to do more of that, is pre-distribution. That is changing the rules and the norms so that the distribution of market income uh, is more fair. Yeah. So that's sort of where I was going to go next. I mean, can you talk about what tools exist to sort of raise the bottom and potentially constrain the top a little bit to reduce that inequality in the pre-distributive phase? I mean, here we're talking about 
earnings. Uh, we're talking about some other sort of earlier in the economic process mechanism. What tools exist and which do you like? Um, well, there's a lot of them and, and, and uh, you know, they all, they all work in different ways. Um, the minimum wage is, is one, but whether you can, whether you can organize unions and whether that's a credible threat, um, that has an effect of, of distribution. Uh, we, uh, on, on the distribution of income, um, whether you have trade treaties, free trade treaties or not, that affects the distribution of income, whether you have a financial system that is allowed to uh, grow to be too large and to skim off the top too much of the natural national wealth. Um, that's uh, affects the distribution. So does antitrust policy. One of the big uh, things that people don't understand these days, and this is different than the inequality of the uh, the 80s and the 90s. Today, the inequality, um, the biggest driver of inequality is from people who have the same skills and do the same job, but one happens to work uh, for Facebook and the other happens to work for, you know, ABC Carpet. And uh, there's a big growing gap between people who have the same skills, the same ex uh, job experience, the same seniority. So what is that about? Well, that's about uh, antitrust policy that has, has not been effectively used so that some businesses and some industries co collect rents, which is above average profits, and other business at the expense of other businesses. Um, so those are all things that I think we have to, have to consider uh, in, in terms of pre-distribution. You mentioned Facebook. We've seen some of these public shame campaigns. Uh, Ro Khanna, congressman from California, who I've interviewed, participated. Bernie Sanders has participated. Companies like Amazon and Walmart, who have been, you could say, shamed, convinced, whatever phrase you want to kind of attach to it, into raising the minimum wage that they would offer to employees. What's your view on that? Because my analysis of the Amazon decision was, this is perfectly good for the individual workers who now get a raise, but it's not actually changing the system. And it's also of, of pretty significant public relations benefit to Amazon, such that it might even be an economic boon. So I was praising it as the right decision, but at the same time, hesitant to say that these shame campaigns are the solution. Well, this is probably maybe a place, David, where you and I are going to disagree. I there's lots of policies that I think we should change. I mentioned some of them. Yeah. But for me, the big change between the 1980s and today is that norms of behavior changed. Hmm. And I can tell you that chief executive officers in the 1950s and 60s had as much power as they do today, but they never would have paid themselves and their immediate colleagues what they pay themselves today. And hmm. the reason they wouldn't be is because it would have been socially unacceptable. And I actually think changing the norms um, is more effective than having lots of government rules and regulations which can tend to get corrupted and they get brittle and inflexible. I'd rather there be a norm in the business community, which is when our company does well, our people do well. Hmm. Um, and that profit sharing comes naturally and no one would think not to do it because if you don't do it, you won't get your customers will leave you. You won't be able to attract and retain good employees. Um, and uh, maybe you won't even be able to attract long term capital. And I would much rather focus on changing the norms than I would in go overdoing the prescription uh, of government rules and regulations. So because in other words, it's, it's in a way you're saying that if we go back to what you said earlier about a lot of times the cost of an increased minimum wage is sort of borne by the CEO and others at the top of the food chain within a company that if you can convince a company to raise its minimum wage, in effect, that has a sort of limiting influence on the outrageous CEO pay that we're seeing. And you're accomplishing a lot of good things. Yeah, I, I, in the case of minimum wage and CEO pay, I wouldn't put those two things in the same paragraph. But your general point is that is my general point that you want to change the norms so that companies feel that it is both in their interest, but also the right thing to do um, to share success uh, in ways that we used to.
um, and that are beneficial in the way they do in countries like Sweden and 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 in Denmark. So we, I don't want a rule or a law that says CEOs can't get paid any more than X. Sure. Um, that that we tried, we sort of tried that, and it, it didn't work so well. Um, we we, we I, and I don't I don't begrudge. You know, the truth is I don't begrudge Bill Gates his billions. I don't um, uh, begrudge most uh, superstar authors um, uh, their their millions. Uh, but when you have a business which is a collective enterprise, hmm. in which in which it's very hard to determine, and the market is is not perfect at this, what everyone's contribution is, you want a system where we all when we all do well when the company does well, and we all do a little bit badly when the company does badly. You want you want the downside as well as the upside. So what I would do, for example, to nudge the world in that direction, is to say it is the government to say in, uh, in its tax code. If you want to deduct the expenses of CEO and executive bonuses or stock options or whatever that are that are meant to be incentive pay, you can do that. But you can only do it if you have a program where you spend at least as much money providing similar incentives to frontline employees, then we'll allow you to deduct them. But if you don't want to give that to the frontline employees, then you can't deduct the ones for the executives. So that's a way of using using the government and the rules to nudge it in behavior. But also, it's good to do that in the context of a changing social norm, which says, you know, companies that are successful sh shouldn't treat their employees badly uh, or squeeze them for every last dollar. Um, that's not a good way uh, to behave. And how do we change the norms? Well, you, you don't change, you change the norms, first of all, by having conversations like this, but you also change the norms when investors, certain investors say, I'm not going to invest in companies that don't treat their workers well. Or you have customers who say, I'm not going to do business with that. You know, one of the things I found about Amazon was very interesting. It was around that time was happening. A lot of my friends were saying, I would say, oh, you know, go buy my book on Amazon and say, oh, they say, I don't do business with Amazon anymore. And I said, really, why not? Well, they don't treat their employees well. I was actually surprised by that. So, and and guess what? I think that had a lot of effect on on Amazon's behavior, as did, by the way, their ability to attract young and young employees who care a lot about these things. We've been speaking about at least partially about some of the topics in the book. Can American capitalism survive? Why greed is not good. Opportunity is not equal and fairness won't make us poor. We've been speaking with the book's author, Stephen Perlstein. Thanks so much for talking to me today. My pleasure, David.